Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the United Church of Christ in Boxborough, to all of you gathered here in the sanctuary, as well as those of you on Zoom. It is good to be gathered together in hybrid community as we worship our Lord. Um, we have a few announcements this morning. Is Kelly in the house? Kelly, would you say a word about our uh, food gathering? Come on over here. Yes, so last week, I believe Gwyneth and Cindy talked about the food drive that we're having for the Little Free Pantry outside. So between now and, well, last week, because I've already seen stuff dropped there between, um, well, basically now until next Sunday, if you could bring in any items that you'd like to donate when you come here, we will stock the pantry, whether it's with coffee, which I needed this morning, perhaps more, or cereal or whatever you'd like to bring. That would be wonderful, so thank you. And Peter, my lovely husband, asked me to say something about the meeting next week, unless you're going to. I'll do that. You can do that, <laughs> thank you. Sarah, did you wanna say a word about the workshop this afternoon, or would you leave? in the gathering room. Uh, Sarah Make will be leading an artful creative process of soul questions. It's a lovely spiritual practice to begin 2024. So I encourage you all to come. I want to remind you that next Sunday following worship is our annual meeting. We'll be meeting both in person and on Zoom. It'll be hybrid and we would encourage all church members to attend. I'm delighted to welcome the Reverend Fred Small into leadership this morning. Fred, it's lovely to have you here. Um, there's uh, biographical information about Fred, but I just wanna tell you, everybody has a story. And here's what I know about Fred's story. He began as a folk singer in the Boston area in which all kinds of audiences were brought together in community. He served as a Unitarian Universalist uh, minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Harvard Square, Cambridge, as well as nearby Littleton. Uh, he was the executive director of the Massachusetts Interfaith uh, Light and Power in providing leadership around environmental justice. And he is also a, a community minister at the Arlington Street UU Church in Boston. Wherever Fred is, he brings together community in song, in hope, in love, in spirit. And I am so delighted to share leadership with you this morning, Fred. Welcome.
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Kirit, and I will be your lay reader today. And we are starting with a call to worship. Fountain of love, pulse of life, breath of life. Earth is filled with the presence of God. A planet filled with the presence of God. A living green blue planet peoples from every corner of creation, the vast reaches of space above us, and the rocks and hills and wonders of the wild. Together this day, let us sense the face of God in all of creation. Lead us, God, as we walk lightly with respect and love for all that you have made. And the gathering hymn this morning is brought to us by Reverend Small. Thank you. Bright morning star. Bright morning star arising, bright morning star arising, bright morning star arising. Days are breaking in my soul. Please rise in body or in spirit. I don't know if that's your tradition here, but it's great to get some breath underneath us. Bright morning star. This, uh, this began as a, a kind of sleepy Appalachian hymn, beautiful hymn, Bright Morning Stars Arising. Some of you may know it. Bright morning stars arising. But Court Dorsey took it to the uh, Seabrook nuclear power protests of the 1970s and, and uh, kicked it up a notch and turned it into a sort of movement anthem. And then I added some verses because I'm a folk singer and that's what we do. Bright morning star, give it a try. Bright morning star arising, bright morning star arising, bright morning star arising, days are breaking in my soul. There's some wonderful harmonies to be found in this song and I love what Pete Seeger used to say about harmony. He said, don't be afraid of harmony. <laughs> Harmony is any note that your neighbor isn't singing. <laughs> See if you can find some. Bright morning star. Bright morning star arising. Bright morning star arising. Bright morning star arising. Days are breaking in my soul for justice and compassion. For justice and compassion, for justice and compassion, for justice and compassion, days are breaking in my soul. For peace in every nation, for peace in every nation, for peace in every nation, for peace in every nation. Days are breaking in my soul for the healing of creation, for the healing of creation, for the healing of creation, for the healing of creation. Days are breaking in my soul for the future of our children. For the future of our children, for the future of our children, for the future of our children, days are breaking in my soul. Last time, bright morning star. Bright morning star arising, bright morning star arising, bright morning star arising. Days are breaking in my soul. Beautiful singing. Amen. Listen to the centering prayer. Dear God, we are gathered here today from all corners of the world, in person or on Zoom, each bringing our own lives and realities with worries and celebrations, with hopes and dreams, with agendas and to-dos, with pains, feelings, aches, big and small. We are coming together as a community of fellow seekers, grateful that we can put down 
worries, fears, and griefs, that we can lift up what brings us joy, that we can nurture and be nurtured in this circle of care. Thank you for inspiring us to show up for each other, because we know that where two of us are gathered, you are in our midst. Amen. Let us now follow with Jesus' prayer. We invite you to name God in whatever way has most meaning for you and say this prayer in the version that speaks to you the most. Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and now we invite you to pass the peace and we do so by greeting each other online through the zoom chat box or in person with a wave or a bow or a high five or how whatever speaks to you we conclude the passing of the peace with a song of celebration God's peace be with you. We have cleared off the table, the leftovers saved. Wash the dishes and put them away. I have told you a story and tucked you in tight at the end of your knockabout day. As the moon sets its sails to carry you to sleep over the midnight sea, I will sing you a song no one sang to me may it keep you good company you can be anybody you want to be you can love whomever you will you can travel any country where your heart leads and know I will love you still you can live by yourself, you can gather friends around, you can choose one special one. And the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. Well, the introduction Reverend Sindri gave me this morning was one of the nicest I've ever received. And what struck me especially was the emphasis on community, because she's entirely right. And as a musician, I, I love to invite community through song. It's not about me, the singer. It's not even really about the song. It's the community that we create and the bond that we that we build with each other when we sing together. So I invite you to sing the chorus to this song. You can be anybody you want to be. You can love whomever you will. You can travel any country where your heart leads and know I will love you still. You can live by yourself. You can gather friends around. You can choose one special one. 
and the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. That's a lot of words, but I'll uh, give you little clues along the way, starting with you can be anybody you want to be. Here we go. You can be anybody you want to be. You can love. You can love whomever, whoever you will. You can travel any country. You can travel any country where your heart leads and know, and know I will love you still. You can live by yourself. You can live by yourself. You can gather friends. You can choose. You can choose one special one. And the only measure of your words, and the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. Some children grow up strong and bold, while some are quiet and kind. Some race on ahead, some take it slow, some go in their own way and time. Some women love women, some men love men, some leave every label behind. You can dream all the day, never reaching the end of everything possible you'll find. Don't be rattled by names, by taunts, by gains, but seek out spirits true. If you give your friends the best part of yourself, they will give the same back to you. You can be anybody you want to be. You can love, you can love whomever you will. You can travel any country. You can travel any country where your heart leads and know, and know I will love you still. You can live by yourself. You can live by yourself. You can gather friends or you can choose. You can choose one special one and the only measure and the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. The love you leave behind when you're done. do love that song. That song was written before the 10th anniversary, the, 10 years ago when we became an open affirming church. And uh, long, long ago when I was so closeted, I got hope from that song and it really sustained me. Um, and I wish that young people, children would have that opportunity to know that story. And in 2024, they do. That song is now a storybook. Fred's going to be selling those in the uh, coffee hour, and he might even autograph them for you. <laughs> so uh, please enjoy that in opportunity in coffee hour. But I'm actually in center stage here to tell you scripture. And the text this morning is from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5, and it goes like this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river was the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves on the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be there anymore. 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and God's servants will worship, and they will see God's face, whose name will be written on their foreheads. Night, there will be no more night. And they will have no need of light from lamp or sun. The Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. Amen. Here ends a telling of God's blessed word. Thanks be to God.
I knew a man once. <clears throat> I knew a man once who tried to save a tree. It was a magnificent red oak <clears throat> planted in the 19th century. Through numberless winters and springs and summers and autumns, its roots had penetrated deep into the soil and its trunk had grown tall and strong. Generations of family and friends and lovers had gathered gratefully in the shade of its broad canopy. And the man loved the tree and held it sacred. But the tree grew close to a building. And one day the owners of the building decreed the building would be improved and expanded. The tree would have to be cut down, they said. And so the man who loved the tree wrote letters and social media posts to try and change their minds. He organized others and enrolled political leaders in his cause. Save the tree, they cried. The owners were unmoved. It's true, they said, the tree is old and beautiful, but it's actually not in very good health. It will die soon anyway. Besides, they said, we have no choice. We've examined every alternative and none is practical within our budget. The tree must go. Outraged, the man assailed their motives and integrity. His letters and posts grew more acerbic and sarcastic. At last, his belligerence and ill temper drove away even people who also cared about the tree and might have helped save it. And so the tree was cut down. And all who saw its severed limbs couldn't help noticing how healthy they looked. And the man cursed the owners for their stupidity and short-sightedness. This good, good man who loved trees so profoundly and so passionately had not learned from them. His feverish, frenetic activism was nothing at all like a tree. He championed the sacredness of trees while neglecting the sacredness of human beings, including his own. He knew the worth of trees but not the peace of trees. Don't we all make the same mistake? At least some of the time. More than half a century ago, the Trappist monk and peace activist Thomas Merton warned, there is a pervasive form of contemporary violence to which the idealist most easily succumbs, activism and overwork. The rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form, of its innate violence. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything, is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of our activism, Merton said, neutralizes our work for peace. It destroys our inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our own work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. The frenzy of our activism destroys our inner capacity for peace and the fruitfulness of our work. Actually, Thomas Merton was lucky. He died before Twitter. <laughs> Twitter, now technically X. Twitter, that twilight zone of snark, contempt, occasional inspiration, and permanent outrage, where I, for one, have wasted far too much of my time. It's easy to be punitive and make others disposable, caution Tom DeWolf and Jody Geddes in the little book of racial healing. The difficult task, they say, is in telling the truth 
in ways that seek healing and transformation. We're beset today by a host of daunting challenges, all of them urgent and interconnected, many seemingly intractable, from patriarchy to white supremacy, from public corruption to secret abuse, from anti-Semitism to Islamophobia to transphobia, from gun violence to armed insurrection, from mass incarceration to mass extinction. It is natural for us to feel grief, anger, fear, and despair. <laughs> I'm a climate justice activist. Despair is my constant companion. By now, it's almost an old friend. It seems every new report coming from the scientists is even more depressing than the last. As Lily Tomlin once observed, things are going to get worse before they get worse. <laughs> the realization that it's too late to prevent significant global warming, too late even to prevent vast suffering, has had a surprising effect on me. Instead of making me more anxious and agitated, somehow it has calmed and steadied me. For decades as a climate activist, I felt like I was in a rowboat above a thundering waterfall, rowing frantically to keep from going over the falls. Well, the boat is going over the falls, my friend. We are plummeting, tumbling, crashing into the unknown at vertiginous speed, and yet somehow at the same time in slow motion. Terrible things are happening and will happen. Millions will suffer and die. With the worst impacts upon those least responsible for the problem, people of color and people living in poverty all around the world. But it is never too late, never too late to save the next life or the next community or the next species. It's never too late to feed the hungry or welcome the stranger. It is never too late to do the next right thing. I vow to do everything I can to reduce the suffering, to tend to the wounded, and to build a more just world. But since I believe it is too late to head off catastrophe, I am resolved to do these things mindfully, with love and compassion and tenderness and generosity of spirit towards others and toward myself. Because given the certainty of suffering, the how of what we do is as important as the what or even the when. As we plunge headlong into the maelstrom, even more important than the question, what am I going to do? Is the question, who am I going to be? Our climate future isn't binary. Everything's going to be wonderful or everything's going to be awful. Ecotopia or dystopia. The future will almost certainly have elements of both. And where the balance between them falls will depend on an infinite number of choices. My choices and your choices and the choices of our children and their children and their children. We don't know what's going to happen. I hope that the human species survives the crisis we have created. But whether or not we do, we know that life on Earth has already survived five major extinctions. Life will endure, and intelligent life will continue to evolve with luck and the grace of God, not only smarter, but also wiser, kinder, 
more compassionate. As we confront this crisis, Badawatami botanist, Badawatami, let me try that again, Potawatomi botanist, there we go. Robin Wall Kimmerer reminds us, we don't have to figure out everything by ourselves. There are intelligences other than our own, teachers all around us. If we understood that, she says, imagine how less lonely the world would be. So as we struggle to save our trees, what can we learn from them? And there's so many of them. I look through the windows and I see so many trees right here. Our kin. What can we learn from trees? One thing we can learn is patience. When we're in mortal danger, patience can be hard to cultivate. Trees can help us. Trees take the long view. They have to. They, many live hundreds, even thousands of years. Longevity counsels patience. By patience, explains Buddhist teacher Pema Chodron, we don't mean enduring, grin and bear it. In any situation, instead of reacting suddenly, we could, we could chew it, smell it, look at it, and open ourselves to see it. What's there? The journey of patience, Chodron says, involves relaxing opening to what's happening, experiencing a sense of wonder. To be patient means to slow down. I'm smiling at myself because to get here, I was rushing like crazy. I got here and all this tech to take care of and get robed and stole and all this rushing, rushing, rushing. And like, ah, and here we are. The cartoon, one of my favorites, shows, a, shows a, a guy in traffic cursing, saying, I'm on my way to my, to my uh, meditation class. I <laughs> curses. You know how they do it in the funnies with the you know, ampersand, exclamation point, fill in the blanks. Anyway, yes, sometimes one rushes <sighs> to be present. But to be patient means to remember to slow down when one can. On an exposed cliffside in the Canadian Great Lakes is a white cedar that's taken 155 years to reach the towering height of four inches. That's taken it slow. Even when a tree is under threat, it responds slowly. When a caterpillar begins to chew on an oak leaf, it can take an hour before defensive compounds reach the leaf to repel the pest. The hectic pace of humans takes a toll on our activism, our relationships, and our souls. We can be peaceful in our fervor, insists Charles Eisenstein, and patient in our urgency. In a society hyped up on hyper-individualism, trees remind us of the interdependence of all things. Far from the solitaries, they, some, they sometimes appear. Trees are deeply embedded and active in a community of interconnection, which forest ecologists sometimes playfully call the wood wide web. Whether by interlacing root systems, fungal networks, or release of chemical scents, trees warn each other of predators and harmful insects. They can even share nutrients with each other. According to ecologist and Shimshian native Dr. Teresa Ryan, when a tree in a warming forest dies, it donates its carbon not to its own offspring or even to others of the same species but to the newest arrivals in the forest, those most likely to survive as temperatures increase, a bequest of generosity akin to altruism. Trees model for us the power of commitment, 
of choosing to be rooted in one place. When a seed takes root, it makes a lifelong commitment to that very spot. There it must adapt or die. Our commitments need not be absolute, but they call us to strive and to struggle to honor our relationships, our communities, and our principles. Commitment demands persistence. Trees persist through high winds, torrential rains, heavy snowstorms that bend their branches, and ice storms that break them. If you've ever seen a tree clinging, clinging to seemingly naked rock, its root tips stretching to every particle of soil, sucking in the tiniest droplet of moisture, you know what persistence looks like. Trees teach us to live with loss. Every fall, deciduous trees surrender their leaves to the forest floor, enriching the soil not only for themselves, but for all who share their ecosystem. And trees endure the deaths of their companions from wind, fire, storm, disease, logging, and old age. Trees embody the perfection of imperfection. Admiring an old maple in Connecticut one time, I was struck by its sinuous beauty. Looking more deeply, I realized its beauty lay precisely in its irregularity, its imperfection. Had it been perfectly straight, perfectly uniform, perfectly symmetrical, it would have been grotesque. Only human beings make things that way. God knows better. Maybe I too could accept my imperfections as a mark of beauty. We teach what we most need to learn. When I spend time with trees, I sense their humility, their kindness, their love. Now, I used to think it anthropomorphic to ascribe human attributes to non-human beings, but I no longer think so. Actually, I think it's anthropocentric to think so. We're all sentient beings. We know that plants feel pain and distress. Why shouldn't trees in their own way feel love? If you doubt that, I... I I don't blame you, but I invite you to spend more time with trees, touching their bark, gazing up at their leaves, just listening. Trees have been among my wisest and most reliable teachers. As a child, Howard Thurman, who would grow up to become one of the great preachers of the 20th century and a spiritual advisor to Martin Luther King Jr. As a child, he discovered a unique relationship with an oak tree in his backyard in Daytona Beach. I could sit my back against its trunk and reach down in the quiet places of my spirit, take out my bruises and my joys, unfold them, and talk about them. I could talk aloud to the oak tree and know I was understood. It too was part of my reality, like the woods, the night, and the pounding surf. My earliest companions giving me space. I have to tell you, last November I went on a book tour of the state of Florida because I wanted to bring in a message of everything possible to that much beleaguered state. And uh, while I was there, I visited uh, Howard Thurman's childhood home, and I didn't know if that tree that he wrote about so so passionately, I, I, I wasn't sure it would still be there. I thought maybe it had fallen victim to disease or 
storm, or, but it was still there. It was still there, that same beautiful, amazing tree. And I sat with my back against its trunk. And I thought, this same tree is nourishing me as it nourished Howard Thurman. And it was one of the highlights of my life. If you ever get to Daytona, Daytona Beach, please take the time to find the Howard Thurman home. Today we need love more than ever. Climate and racial justice advocate Mary Anais Hagler confesses that love is what keeps her going. I don't mean any simple, sappy kind of love, she declares. I mean living, breathing, heart-beating love, wild love. This love is not a noun. She is an action verb. She can shoot stars into the sky. She can spark a movement. She can sustain a revolution. I love this beautiful, mysterious, complicated planet we get to call home. I love that nighttime symphony on steamy southern nights when the frogs croak and the crickets sing and the owls hunt. I love the delicate feel of honeysuckle petals and the warm, greeny earth and dewy grass on my bare feet. This love is strong enough to break through the terror. She is hot enough to burn through anger and turn into fury. She can shake you out of your despair and propel you to the front of the battlefield. It's a love that can also, even in the teeth of these most insurmountable odds, give me hope. If I'm brave enough to accept it. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. But love, love never ends. I'll let the trees have the last word. With the assistance of their friend and interpreter, the late poet, Mary Oliver. Technically, Unitarian Universalists don't have any saints, but I think if we did, Mary Oliver would be in that pantheon. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locusts, equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me and daily. I am so distant from the hope of myself, in which I have goodness and discernment, and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches, and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this. To go easy. To be filled with light. And to shine. I would invite you to stand if that's comfortable for you as we sing stars and planets flung in orbit.
Please be seated. We come to the time in our service where we have an opportunity to share with one another joys and concerns. Do we have uh, joys or concerns for the community and faith this morning? Yes. Yeah. Wendy. We praise God for Damon's piano playing, for the generosity of piano lessons, and for the grace of being at the Bull Run and Shirley at just the right time. <laughs> Other joys or concerns this morning? I'd like to uh, celebrate the life of Isabel and please keep uh, Mary and um, Al in your prayers. Mary's mother died last Monday. The calling hours are tomorrow in Vermont and the funeral Tuesday. So please keep Mary and Al in your prayers. Other concerns is, yes, Damon. I'm another boy. Uh, I want to look uh, uh, what was Fred. Fred. <laughs> Fred, I was called his name. But uh, his, um, Beautiful talent in his music and his speeches, you know. Um, as my boss would say that I work with, um, I don't believe in coincidences. coincidences. I believe that the whole world was like, yeah. I worked on that. It was a nice process for me to, to get to you know, like, this beautiful form of beautiful conception. But, Fred, the Lord brought people here to this moment of music and word and community. Thank you so much for the extraordinary gift of your ministry. We're very grateful. <laughs> Other joys or concerns this morning for the community of faith? Yes, Marley. Spiritual music is COVID and flu and all these things just running rampant. So many people are ill. Please pray for all of those who are ill with COVID and flu and RSV, and may those who are sick soon feel better, and those who are well stay well. <laughs> Thank you. Any other? And let us, yes, Kelly. We pray, pray for peace around the world, especially for those who are experiencing displacement and for refugees, that they would find home. Thank you. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your presence here and now in this moment of community. We give you thanks for hybrid community where we gather virtually as well as in person. We give you thanks for poetry and song and story and scripture. We give you thanks for faith which continues to buoy us and hold us despite our questions or doubts or uncertainties or lack of understanding. There is a knowledge and a wisdom that is deeper than deep in which you re let us rest. We thank you for the peace of trees. We thank you that they are still our teachers. We thank you for the wisdom of despair being a constant companion because there is a way that we become mindful when that is all that is left. Remind us to stay in the present moment because that is where your love is. Forgive us when we fuss and grieve over the past. Forgive us when we worry and are anxious about the future. Call us again and again into the place where you are. 
a place of eternity, of unconditional love, of hope, the same place that a tree is rooted. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We pray for those who are ill with COVID or flu that your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for those who are seeking new homelands because of whatever climate catastrophes or war-torn terror is in their own land. We pray that you would guide us moment by moment, day by day, to be kind, to help, to listen, to be fully ourselves, the one you created us to be, to bring your light and your peace into the world. Dear and gracious God, we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. a God who envisioned a tree of life whose leaves were the healing of all nations. And with that image, we can't help but be hopeful and joyful and want to give generously in honor of the one who gave love so generously to us. In that spirit, let us receive our morning offering. Gracious God, we give you thanks for generosity. We give you thanks for the giving of these gifts and tithes and offerings and ask that they would be used to build your ministry, to build justice, to create peace wherever you call. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lead us in our closing song, Fred. Ain't you got a right? Ain't you got a right? 
Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? That's your part. Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? This song was written by Guy Carawan, inspired by the spirituality of the Carolina Sea Islands. Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Give it a try. Ain't you got a right? Ain't you got a right? Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Ain't you got a right? 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 Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? So rocky the road. So rocky the road, so dangerous the journey, so dangerous the journey, but we got a right, but we got a right, ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right? Ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right to the tree of life? We come from a distance. We come from a distance. We come. We come from a distance. And we got a right. And we got a right. Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Ain't you got a right? 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 Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Our lives will be sweeter. Our lives will be sweeter. Our lives will be sweeter. Cause we got a right, ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right? Ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right? Ain't you got a right, ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Now, before the pandemic, I would always invite people to sing the chorus through one last time and join hands with each other. And the pandemic changed a lot of things. Some of us may feel comfortable once again joining hands. And if you do, I invite you to join hands with your neighbor. If you do not, do not. And don't let anybody grab your hand if you don't want to join hands. But if you do, reach out, join the hands of your neighbor. And if you don't, God bless you. Don't touch anybody. <laughs> Here we go. Ain't you got a right? 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 Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? Ain't you got a right? Ain't Ain't you got a right? 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 Ain't you got a right to the tree of words, the words of Stephanie Kaza. Let go of the place that holds. Let go of the place that flinches. Let go of the place that controls. Let go of the place that fears. Listen, the wind is breathing in the trees. Moving through the dark night, I practice courage accepting the vastness of what I cannot see. Amen.
invite you to unmute yourself if you'd like to have a little time.